My contention is that the lives we lead are preoccupied far too much with prose and not enough with poetry. And what I mean by that is that too much of our energy and our time is spent on things which are actually banal and mundane and routine, and far too little is spent on the magical and the creative. And I guess it was that thought which inspired Stephen Bailey and I to write this book, which tries to explore how creativity works and sometimes how it doesn't. And you may say, actually, is it that important? I know creativity is a buzzword now, but so is Bitcoin and Brexit, and we slightly hope we'll have forgotten about those in a year or so. But actually, creativity, I think, is of fundamental importance, because if you examine what it is, it's the ability to think of ideas which change the circumstances of our lives. And that is something which no other species on the planet is capable of doing. Creativity is the thing which separates us from other animals. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. At some point, somebody must have noticed a round-shaped stone rolling down a hill and thought, I wonder if that energy could be used in some way. And the wheel was invented, and that opened the door for the Industrial Revolution, for modern transport, and so much more. At some point in history, somebody must have thought, Instead of eating these grapes, why don't I throw them in a bucket, jump up and down on them my bare feet for a while, <laughs> let the result go off, then put it in a bottle and not drink it for several years? It's quite a strange train of thought for them to have pursued. <laughs> but I'm so glad they did, because they created wine, which I think is one of life's civilizing pleasures. At some point when primitive man was starting to use words, somebody must have thought... I wonder how we can kind of deconstruct those words into component parts, and could we use that? And so the concept of alphabet was created, and with that, the beginning of language and modern communication. It's not all good, however. Quite recently, somebody wondered what would happen if you split an atom in half, and we know the answer. They created nuclear warfare, a quarter of a million needless deaths in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and a fragile world order. So it's not always good. But it is what separates us from all other species. And given how important it is, it's surprising how much bullshit there is talked about it. Particularly in the corporate world, which seems to me kind of is drawn to the idea of creativity, but generally doesn't quite understand how to embrace it. And a good example of that is the idea that if you've got a big problem to solve in a business, what you do is you get a team of eight or ten of your brightest and best together, and you send them off to a rather comfortable country house hotel, and it's called variously a brainstorm or an away day, and what happens is you spend the whole day there uh, drinking mineral water and tepid coffee, um, and at the end of it, you have achieved absolutely fuck all squared. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm guessing you some, have be some of you have been to a brainstorm. <laughs> But these things are incredibly popular. If you go to the parts of the country during the week where there are a lot of these hotels, they've all got brainstorms going on. It's Magritte's world. It's raining businessmen. <laughs> but it's worth inquiring, actually, why don't they work? There is a very good psychological reason. Because, actually, what inspires a creative idea is that the creative part of your brain gets a kind of kick up the bum for, of adrenaline, because you, that adrenaline comes because you know you have to do this thing. That's why, actually, deadlines are important in the creative process, because they cause that adrenaline to happen. But if you've got a group of people, what happens is, because the responsibility is shared, so is the, the adrenaline, and because it's shared, it's kind of watered down. And actually, while I should be thinking in my group, I want to solve this problem, what I'm actually thinking is, but if I don't, somebody else will. And therefore, it doesn't happen. And there's a technical term for this. It's called the Ringelmann effect. It's named after a French scientist called Professor Maximilian Ringelmann, who devoted a lot of his life to studying the way people worked in groups. And his big theory, which is illustrated by this chart, is his big discovery was that the more people you put on a project, the less productive each individual person is. And so if you've got 10 people on the project, you add two more, all that happens is the first 10 become slightly less effective. So the technical term for this is the Ringelmann effect, but if you work in a modern office, you may just call it normal life. <laughs>
But the truth of the matter is that creativity isn't a team game, it's an individual activity. Hamlet was not written by a committee. So that's myth number one. Myth number two, which I'd like to get on to, is the idea that if you're searching for a solution, if you produce dozens of ideas, by the law of averages, one of them is going to be wonderful. It's so not like that. When I was running my advertising business, if we're working on a TV commercial idea for a client, they quite often say, please show me lots of scripts, because I know one of them's going to be good. You don't want lots of scripts, you want one good one. If I can make the point by analogy, the person you're looking at on the screen is Justin Rose, who is about the third or fourth best golfer in the world, and the person you're looking at on the stage is Roger Mavity, who's about the third or fourth hundred millionth best golfer in the world. Now, if Justin and I went to the driving range and you gave him one ball only, he hit it about 330 yards because he does that every time. If you gave me 10, actually, let's say make it 100. No, we'll go for 1,000. He said, by the law of averages, one of those is going to go further than Justin's. They won't. None of them will get much more than halfway. You could give me 10,000. It would make no difference. Because the truth of the matter is that he has a gift and I don't. And I find it, I work sometimes as an art photographer and I find it amazingly insulting. People say to me, oh, I suppose with modern digital cameras it's quite easy. You just take thousands of photographs and one of them's bound to be rather good. <laughs> I wish. I worked on a project recently, well, and it was interesting because this theme came up earlier today. I was exploring the idea that in modern life, it's sometimes surprisingly difficult to separate what's real from what's fake. And I thought an interesting visual metaphor for this would be to take scenes with mannequins who are sort of lifelike and lifeless at the same time, muddled up with real people in a way that you had to look quite hard to see which was which. And this is one of the photographs I took in that series. And you can see it's in a mannequin factory. They've come off the production line. They're waiting for Philip Green to come and collect them and take them to go in the top shot window. Except that when you look slightly more closely, you realise that one of them isn't a mannequin, it's a real person. But you have to stop and think for a second. Now, contrary to conventional wisdom, I didn't go to a mannequin factory with my digital camera and take thousands of random photographs. I had the idea and I worked on it for about 12 weeks on where the location would be, how many models there would be, how would they be composed, how would it be lit, how could we make the human person look like the mannequin, and so forth. There was a huge amount of preparation around one idea, no law of averages, thank you. And when we actually got to do the shoot, we were only there for about 25 minutes. Because all the work had been done. I actually pressed the shutter three times, once for the photograph and twice more for just in case. So much for the law of averages. The truth of the matter is that in order to get a solution to a problem, what you need is one really powerful idea and 10 mediocre ones or 20 mediocre ones or 1,000 mediocre ones is never going to add up to one great one. So if that's a bit about what creativity isn't, let's move on to something more important, which is what creativity is. One of the things that's clear about it is it's extraordinarily hard to generate it, even you know, choosing a present for your partner's birthday is hard, let alone finding an idea for a film script or a book. And it's also very often hard to recognise creativity. But actually, there's a very simple reason for that, which is the nature of creativity is that you are, by definition, producing something which is new. You can't create something which existed already. And if it's new, it's unfamiliar. And actually, the unfamiliar is a territory most human beings don't like to visit very often. We feel quite uncomfortable with new thinking. We flatter ourselves in this sort of audience that we're not like that, but I suspect none of us are entirely above it. On the whole, human beings feel secure when they are behaving in a way that most other human beings are behaving. And that's why creativity is so difficult, because it's about new stuff, and it's about taking things away from the existing comfort zone. But I if I can give you an example of this kind of herd instinct and the wanting to do what other people do, take the curious thing of whether you're left or right-handed. The vast majority of the world is right-handed, and that figure changes very little 
uh, from one country or culture to another. Now, clearly, in practice, it doesn't make a fig of difference whether you're left-handed or right-handed. And yet, in spite of that, if you look at how the subject's been treated through history, until relatively recently, if you were a left-handed person in society, you were dismissed as a weak character, a flawed person, somebody who's untrustworthy, unreliable, somebody you wouldn't employ, somebody you wouldn't lend money to. It's ridiculous, but it's actually how left-handed people have been treated until relatively recently in human history. And you still see kind of relics of that prejudice in the language that we use today. If somebody's socially slightly awkward, we call them gauche, which of course comes from the French word for left. If somebody's a bit creepy, we call them sinister, which of course is the Latin word for left. If we're giving directions to somebody and we want to say, go straight ahead, do we say, go straight ahead? Oh, of course not. We say, keep right on. Keep right on? For it doesn't make sense, does it? But it's what we say. And it's exactly the same construction in French, interestingly, because you'll know from road signs you've seen in France, middle of the town, Centreville, straight ahead, it says, tout droit, which means all right. Ridiculous, but it's how people are. And it'd be easy to dismiss that as a sort of hangover from an earlier time. But if you take something which is very much of today, namely Tinder, if you see someone on Tinder you profoundly don't want to see again, what do you do? You swipe to the left, because left equals bad, because left equates with the minority activity. And we all suffer from herd instinct. If you see somebody who's rather hot and you'd like to have a mojito with at 6.30 tonight, <laughs> what do you do? You swipe to the right, because right is good, because it's where most people are at. And that is the fundamental thinking which is so obstructive to creativity because creativity is essentially about finding different original ways of doing things for an audience of mankind which has a strong built-in preference for the conservative route and doing it the way we always have done. Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said creativity is an endless struggle against the status quo, which sounds a bit gloomy, but actually, if you think about it, it's kind of inevitable. Because if the point of creativity is to find new ways of doing things, it's bound to challenge the existing order, and it should do. And another philosopher, Kierkegaard, the Dane, even more gloomily said, the truth always rests with the minority, which sounds dark and quite anti-democratic, uh, anti although, speaking as somebody who voted for Remain, I'm slightly sympathetic with Kierkegaard. <laughs> But I think what he was really driving at is that when people produce new ideas, the majority tend not to recognize them, they tend to reject them because it takes them out of their comfort zone. And it's only a small minority that get it quite quickly. And you see that repeated again and again in the way that new art ideas are accepted, or not as the case may be. Um, this is an extraordinary picture by... Manet, painted in 1863, Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Picnic on the Grass, and it was commissioned um, by the great and good of the French art world at the height of the French Impressionist movement. Paris was a centre of massive artistic activity. They wanted to put on a grand show, the Grand Salon, and they commissioned Manet, who was one of the great painters of the day, to produce a centrepiece for this show, and this was the work that he did. But, of course, as soon as they saw it, they threw up their hands in horror and said, oh, God, we can't possibly hang that in our gallery because it's not like what we're used to. And they rejected the work. Paul Manet had to set up his own Salon de Refuse, which is a kind of rejects show, so that he could at least hang it somewhere. But if you look at it, the reason that they were so offended is very clear because until that point, the nude in art had been a very common, oft-repeated theme but it was always repeated in a particular way, that the nude was rather stylized, almost like a kind of statue. Whereas this nude is quite sort of natural. She's just sitting there relaxed, having a picnic with these two guys who are weirdly fully clothed while she's naked, which is also profoundly disturbing and quite out of character with any art that people had seen before. And what's most bizarre of all is that nobody's paying any attention to the fact that she's get, got her kit off and they haven't. The guys look as if they're chatting about something mundane, could be football, and, and she's looking away from them and is rather bored, so probably is football. 
But it's a wonderful example of an amazing work of art which is completely rejected when it was done because it challenged the existing standards and the existing conventions. Now, of course, 150 years later, it's recognised as a masterpiece and it hangs in pride of place in the Musée d'Orsay, one of the most prestigious museums in France. So let's move on to the biggest question of all, which is this thing that we all sort of seek, creativity. How do you actually stimulate it? Is the right thing to do to get yourself into a very calm state of mind, into a very good place, so everything's at peace with the world? Sadly not. Exactly the opposite is true. Creativity comes out of misery, out of pain, out of dissatisfaction. And if you think about it, it couldn't be otherwise, because a guy who is completely happy with the world and completely happy with his place in it has got absolutely no incentive to produce something new and different. The only person who's going to want and be inspired to produce something that's exciting and new is somebody who's fundamentally unhappy with how things are at the moment. And that unhappiness is quite often not only with the world out there, artists are very often dissatisfied with themselves and their own performance. A very interesting example of that is J.M. Turner, who's probably one of the few really world-class artists that Britain has ever produced. And Turner was endlessly dissatisfied with his own work. No matter whatever anybody else thought about it, he always thought it wasn't good enough, it wasn't extreme enough, and he was pushing himself endlessly to do more. And I can show you an example. This is an early Turner, painted in 1810 when he was a young man. It's a landscape of Petworth House in Sussex. It's quite a nice picture. Um, if your aunt died and left it to you in her will, you probably wouldn't stick it in the bin. But it really isn't remarkable. It doesn't stir the soul, does it? It's just quite pleasant. And that troubled Turner. He knew that, and his whole life was searching to do something which took his art to a much more extreme position. If you jump now to a much later Turner, this is Snowstorm Off a Harbour Mouth, painted in 1842. My God, that certainly does stir the soul. It's dramatic, a sort of vortex of violence, frightening, threatening, a really remarkable painting. And I think you could argue that Turner had met his own ambition of producing something which was really extreme and startling. And interestingly, even though you can just about pick up a tiny bit of a flag and maybe a mast of a boat, I think arguably this is the first abstract painting in the history of art. And Turner was a huge inspiration to many of the artists that followed, particularly Mark Rothko, the American abstract painter of the uh, 1960s and 50s and 70s, uh, and Rothko admitted a huge debt to Turner's work. This is one of Rothko's work, a very dark and brooding canvas. And uh, sadly, in line with the theme of dissatisfaction, uh, Rothko painted this at the height of his fame and celebrity and power, and shortly afterwards took his own life. So creativity isn't easy, it is painful, but it is incredibly important, and we experience it all around us all the time, and it is what puts the poetry back into our lives. And yes, of course we experience it in the big ways. Here, for example, is the Sistine Chapel uh, in Rome, Michelangelo's masterpiece. But it's important to realise that we experience creativity around us all the time in quite small ways. Here's a paperclip. Very simple invention, but an incredibly creative idea costs virtually nothing to make, and makes life a little bit easier in the office for people every day. I don't know who here in the audience has got kids who are at the age where they haven't yet mastered the shoelace knot, but I think if any of you have, you'll agree with me that Velcro trainers <laughs> are a truly creative invention. And rather like the man with the wine, at some point in history, somebody must have asked themselves the all-important question of what would happen if you hung a dead fish in the roof when there was a fire going on downstairs. Quite a curious thing to worry about. <laughs> well, I'm glad they did, because they created the concept of smoked fish, those wonderful delicacies like smoked salmon and kippers. And if, like me, you enjoy a kipper for breakfast occasionally, the next time you have one, remind yourself you're not just having a very healthy breakfast, you're actually sharing a creative experience and therefore you're putting a bit of poetry back into your life. Thank you. <laughs>